Okay, well, maybe uh, we'll get underway if that's all right. Uh, Falcha, uh, welcome to Ware Haley. Um, I'm so happy to see all of you from all over the world joining us tonight. Uh, it's Michi Ian McCloach. My name is Ian McLeod. Um, and again, I'm so happy that you're all here for um, our session this evening, which is Making Space for Gaelic. Uh, before we begin, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. I guess Many of us tonight are gathering on the sacred land of Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Uh, I would also just like to add to that that whenever I uh, offer a land acknowledgement, I really try to think about what those words mean and and make sure that they they aren't just sort of um, a sort of a performance, but that they're a, they're a very deeply meaningful um, um, thought and idea that I'm sharing. So I'd invite you to do the same thing. And um, wherever you're joining us from, I, I would ask you to do that. Kersana Hashin and Shah. Well, the purpose of Air Haley is to create a welcoming and convivial space where we share moments and stories that speak to our connection with Gaelic language, culture, and community. Through telling and listening to stories, we should light on and invite the stories we want more of in our lives and our communities. By sharing and listening together, we collectively make meaning and imagine new possibilities for Gaelic in our lives. This season, we're contemplating why Gaelic matters. In our planning, we thought, Uh, in our planning, we thought about the Gallic Nova Scotia symbol. We see the salmon, a symbol of wisdom in the center in the shape of a G representing Gales and Gallic. The ripples on the outside edges represent all the aspects of our culture, story, song, dance, customs, music, foodways, kinship, history, and so much more. Why does it all matter? And what meaning can we make in 2023? How can language and culture contribute to our resilience in these times? Um, I also uh, just want to sort of say, particularly for those joining us from Scotland, that often in Nova Scotia, when um, communicating in English, uh, we use the Gaelic pronunciation to describe the language. Um, so you may hear both pronunciations tonight. Um, and so, as I said, tonight is the Making Space for Gaelic session. And what we're going to do now is we're going to put you into these aforementioned uh, English and Gaelic um, breakout rooms and uh, we're also going to be putting some questions for you to consider in the chat uh, and i'll read them out now as well um so uh in this first breakout room really what you're going to be doing is introducing yourselves to one another and and um we really uh the reason we do this is is um kind of to replicate what a, a kaylee in a, a kitchen would be like uh, and we would like in these rooms for people to say hello to each other, make connections, and to begin a conversation. Um, so we're going to break you into groups of three. Uh, sometimes there might be a group of two or four, but for the most part, there'll be three. And the idea is that you're going to introduce yourselves, uh, and you're going to also answer a specific question we have. So right now, Karen's busy creating uh, the Gaelic speaking breakout rooms. Again, for anybody who would like to have a Gallic language breakout room, we'd invite you to put a G uh, in front of your name. Um, and um, if you aren't able to get into one of those rooms the first time, we're going to try to do it around uh, in the second uh, breakout room. There'll be a second one tonight. Um, and that's a new sort of innovation this year. We're trying to uh, have as much of the language in, um, in our sessions as possible. Um, so in those rooms of three people, you will each have three minutes to speak. Um, and sometimes people think that, you know, that's too much. Other times people think it's not enough. It will go fairly quickly, but we'd invite you to, to take your full three minutes. Um, and really it's about listening and uh, sharing. Um, when it's time for the second person to be in sharing, uh, when the first three minutes is up, um, you'll move on to that person and then the third person for a total of about nine minutes or so. In the groups of two or four people, we just ask that you uh, adjust um, the math accordingly. Um, and again, I'll be sharing the uh, prompts uh, that we're asking you to answer in the breakout rooms uh, verbally now, and they'll also be typed in the chat. 
So the two questions we're going to ask you to uh, address in this first breakout room is introducing yourself to one another, saying where you're calling from. And then the question we'd ask that you answer is to take us to a moment in your life when you felt outside your comfort zone while you were trying to learn something. Uh, we're going to copy those into the chat. Uh, and they will carry with you into the breakout rooms. Um, and I think that is most of what I had to say. Karen, are the rooms ready? Yes, and I th think everyone who requested a Gaelic room is going to be in one. I okay. hope so. <laughs> Perfect. So you're going to have roughly nine minutes, and we'll send you some prompts as the as the clock runs down. But we just ask that you manage that time fairly and and allow everybody to speak. And, uh, uh, you know, this is really an opportunity to listen as well. So uh, we will see you back in a little bit. Thank you. Malapa. Anna Malapa. Agus hami de bi lui pfontr vien de galik fat mo griach mar hitchar. Agus marahush me eke brekeft grup haro tulum diev kabin anna soyeche mar kenarst e de hiet skal vain. Travienda Gaelic, the Scabushina the Stier, who has a valavor, a marcher, as Nahilan, you know, who is the yelp of Maravik do racket. Ach, this Marahush me ha, my farsh in Yachtriacum, I guess Nishcha Groshin, a gloss at Kamalua, is a gar, a Kamalua, who filled Travienda Gaelic, if she knew. Tapalat, I guess Uhain Rabbisht, Kaosa. Well, it's Nisha Rappers, I guess. May I keep resting? I'm a hopeful and a hell. I mean, go for the and in Korea, fat Koi Blinikin, I guess, and in Alberta, fat Jake Blinikin, I guess, and the Arash and the Cape Breton, I guess, I can't. 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 I I mean, check us back in. I guess, uh, I mean, check us back in the Gaelic. So, I guess, how many? It's only to have me all in the I mean, the game sort of the X8 of X. And during the trip around the machine, he had told us. Gleva. I guess, how ha, Castell Akam, um, a, a rabbit, I guess, and an Jason, a gana, uh, Donalda, uh, can you hold it to uh, a Gaelic or Santa Hia Torres, Agus Burla? Well, um, who will be Gaelic to the Bobby Beck beat up a Gaelic at Mahanavish, I guess, by Isha Purak and in Port Hawksbury, as a gut, I guess, by Gita Relong, Titan Chown doing you, I guess, via Mitchell Dolan, the tree, Kaylee and Chown doing you by Purak and Machin, I guess, uh, you got the brain Gaelic, you know, you know, question. I guess, uh, who let me bear an attic in Kujak? I never listen to when you was in up. I used to be back in the bear of Kujak. I guess, like an old, uh, couldn't you hold it to a Gaelic or son? He had taught us, I guess, I guess, bear the Kujak. I shouldn't, uh, come out to the Vada, who have a mohawk on the dachy for a raw Gaelic, the Udin, Gamatra, Coyersnach, and the Mian, who she chased. Agus Krufja the Van Amad, Agus Goyersnach Magosh in the Napi and Akin Chagalik with Yakur Kale. Amiacholoch le Nu Yakin, Agus Ha Amis Munion, Amikinich Gol the Mipel the Dosher Stocha is a record, is record player, no Stocha television, Goshen television as Shakatan, Agus Amikin Shigan, Buyan Kuchach as a break from Hai. Shachner, I can you and Wunskal, a drink Gaelic, the matter. I know the high Mavrad is all you can skull, Shapirlovic, the land skull, a hoof, Shinavoy, a vac, what the mad televisions were shin at doing. Um, ach, uh, yeah, shin. Taplet. Well, I'm going to stop there for a second and I'm just going to talk about what just happened because we started speaking in Gaelic. And we just kept going and we're now going to switch to English. And the reason we've done that is we're trying to model something. Tonight's session is called Making Space for Gaelic. And it really came about for a couple of reasons. And I, I don't want to talk too much about myself, but I'll, I'll just sort of talk about a couple of 
of the places um, that sort of the genesis of what uh, what tonight's idea is all about. There's a, a a situation that many people, and I was speaking with Donald about this, and it's it's common in Scotland as well as in Nova Scotia that people will be familiar with, which is basically at one time, say a dozen people, ten of whom were Gaelic speakers, would gather, and of course, two of those people couldn't speak Gaelic, so the default language would be English. And then, of course, we know over time it wasn't ten people; it was seven people; it was three people; it's one person now. Um, so that was in the background during our conversations as a group about this year's session. There's also something that happened uh, with a friend of mine who's here tonight. I won't say who it is. Um, who uh, I was having a conversation with in Gaelic uh, not that long ago, and it was in a space where there were learners present, and there were certainly people with varying degrees of language ability. But my friend and I were speaking in Gaelic, and somebody interrupted us who we didn't know very well, and sort of forced us to speak in English. And I, I don't know that either one of us like handled it as well as we could have. And afterwards, I was thinking about it a lot, and I was wondering, you know, was I rude? And if I was rude, was maybe that was okay? And so these are very difficult questions we're going to kind of wrestle with tonight. And really, what we want to talk about is how you can make space for a minoritized language, both in terms of um, the group, the collective, and community spaces, but also as an individual learner. How can you maybe uh, center the language more than is sometimes the case? Um, so I just asked uh, Dinalda and uh, Robert, you know, sort of who they were and when did they first hear Gaelic and when did they first hear English? So I want to follow up uh, that question with a question. We'll start with Dinalda, which is like, how did it make you feel when you heard English on that record player or TV for the first time? What did it sound like to you? I think, um, I think because English was... Uh, also within the community to a certain extent. And when you went to the primary school that I went to, although everybody who went there came from Gaelic speaking homes, a lot of the learning was actually done with English textbooks and English reading books and that sort of thing, because maybe because uh, there weren't the resources available in Gaelic, but I think it was to do with this sort of education system at the time where it was felt that to progress, you'd have to progress in a through an English curriculum. Yes, you have Gaelic, but what's that going to do for you? How's that going to help you in the future? Yes, you can get a qualification in Gaelic, but you also need to have these qualifications to get to university because at that time as well, I don't think as much um, uh, to have a qualification in Gaelic wasn't given as much credence, credence as having something through the to, in English. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, fr from that point of view, you know, you, you're surrounded by English. It's, it's so strong that, you know, you can't resist it in a way. But equally, though, we had parents who would never have spoken to us in English or anybody in the community. And having that strength within the community also kept your breadth of language, you know, very fluent and, and very strong. And, and you know, the, there's vocabulary that I use to this day in, in Gaelic that I got off my parents that I've, you know, that, that would not maybe feature in the sort of um, language that would be taught in, in schools. It was kind of a dialectal thing or a community, community language. So. Do you, do you remember when you were in primary school how you felt when you heard English and when you you sort of had to speak English in certain contexts? How that made you feel? I think I think you just accepted it. I think right. it was just um, something that that was expected of you, um, and uh, you you had the the two worlds as it were. Yeah, you adapted to that depending on the, on the circumstance and the context. And I remember um, all, all the pupils at the school were Gaelic speakers, but I remember a family moved from Glasgow. And although the mum and dad were from, uh, you know, a, a, a village down the road from the school, the children had been raised in Glasgow, so they didn't have any Gaelic at all. So they were, they were immersed, as it were, in that primary school. But out in the playground, you would have to speak English to them because until they they got to a level of Gaelic where they could either understand. But even, even if I meet some of these 
the young people nowadays, I would still speak to them in English because they just didn't have the, the skills in Gaelic at that time. And I'll, um, I'll turn to you now, Robert, and kind of ask the same question. How did you sure. feel when you, as a child or even later when you would hear Gaelic and you would hear English? Would you feel differently when you hear the two languages? Yeah, I went to school in, in Richmond County. I went to school in, in, in French. I was put in French, French immersion as a black girl. So um, I went to school and I was learning another language that I got to have a, a secret language with, with my sister that couldn't, my parents couldn't understand. Whereas my grandparents' generation, they had a language that their children couldn't understand. So we kind of did a little flip around there. And uh, Cape Breton is quite multicultural. There's a lot going on here. There has been for some some years, you know, in the community, there's French communities around me. So I heard a lot more French than than Gaelic, I suppose, after that, going to school especially. And uh, I went to, went to school in that medium. And there was a lot of kids of Acadian background in the class and the teachers would recognize them by their names. They'd say, you're Acadian. And then they would look at me and my Mac, friends or whatever, and they'd say, oh, you guys are English, they would say, and we, we kind of do a little thing with our heads, like, oh, that's not what we were told at home, sort of thing. So there was, there was a little bit of jockeying for position in the languages of Cape Breton, I suppose, that was, wasn't just, just the English, there's a few other things kind of going on there. And I, I, I don't think I got the, I wasn't mm -hmm. properly educated in, in my own history at school. Yes. Well, I think that's a very common story, unfortunately, yeah. and part of the part of the reason we're probably here tonight too. Um, yes. I, I was, I, going, sorry, I was go going to say, I was going to say as well that that I I remember that you know the perception of you know um, that what what's Gaelic going to do for you in your future, um, and that I would hope is not there anymore. Uh, but there are still maybe communities who are quite resistant to having a Gaelic medium school or, or that within their, their community because they feel, oh, we've already got Gaelic. We've already got, we don't need to have a, a school for that. It's within, within the community. But every bit helps to revitalize the language as far as I'm concerned. I want to ask you both now, sort of moving forward as into the present as adults, as 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 um, speakers about Gaelic and English, um, and especially given what we just sort of did in the switch a few minutes ago, what have you noticed about situations where a conversation switches from Gaelic to English? What what typically happens there? Well, well, will I start? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I think. Um, I've always been of the belief that in, in a situation like that, as having worked in a big school um, where the, the vision, values and aims of the school and the policy is for Gaelic to be heard and, and used in all contexts, you're always going to have people who don't have the language within the school. And it does affect the kind of Gaelic ethos, if you like, because as Gales, we are naturally polite and would revert, you know, in order for somebody not to feel uncomfortable or to feel left out, you would automatically revert to English. And I, I saw it happening in, in many different areas within the school. For example, the, the staff room that we had, a huge big staff room. Uh, but if we had a visitor and maybe a visiting psychologist or something like that, who would not have garlic and was sitting have a cup in, the staff would in, in and around that person would have to speak in English uh, for that person to be welcomed and comfortable. And I've never, until you brought that up about, well, you know, that's how we felt, but we don't know how the person felt because we very readily went into English, whereas maybe we should have had a wee step back from that. But that's very difficult to do in that circumstance. It's a challenge, I would say. Do you, do you ever remember a time when that didn't happen, where there was somebody who was visiting and people stayed in Gaelic? Um, very rarely. I have to. I have to be honest and say that very rarely. Um, and you know that that's something I suppose uh, that 
is the challenge because you, you have these people in your area, in your school or whatever it may be for a purpose and you're looking for something from them. Uh, and you want them to be on, on your side if you want. But they also have to an understanding, have an understanding of what you're trying to do. And after a period of time, if, for example, we had the psychologist coming lots and lots of times, by then they would have picked up some of the, you know, phrases to use within, whether it was that sort of thing, to try and also show the importance of the language within that environment and the effort that they were trying to make. But it happens, it happens all the time. I mean, we, I'm sitting here with my sister and we would have been speaking Gaelic before I came on here, but we also have a friend who doesn't speak Gaelic. So if we go out, we automatically speak in English unless we're talking about somebody. Yes. I don't want to, I don't want to shame your friend, but like, has your friend ever like asked about, oh, can I, can you teach me some Gaelic or? Oh, absolutely. She's, she's done Duolingo and ever, she's really made an effort, but not really moved forward mm -hmm. with the language. She's still at a very kind of basic level, but equally though, she doesn't get offended. That's not the word to use, but she's quite happy for us to speak in, in Gaelic. Uh, she'll know that one of us will translate very quietly what we've just said. But, yeah. Um, so there, there's a way around it, but it, it is, it's a challenge. What, what about you, Robert? What have you noticed about situations where there's that switch from, from Gaelic to English? What, what do you think that's about and what's going on in those situations? Yeah, I, I mean, historically, there's been a lot of different things, a lot of reasons why people would do that. I, I, I think it's that you don't want to, in my case, what I felt is that I don't want to have people uncomfortable. And, and, and whether that, as you mentioned, whether that discomfort is even real, maybe they're curious. But it's, there's some kind of a sense, I've had a sense of, well, I better, I better just go right into the English. What if they think I'm saying something bad about them or, or, or that kind of thought? You know? mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm, I'm working on that. I'm, I'm changing that a little bit because, and I have a lot of fun speaking Gaelic. So. Maybe they'll, you know, people will see that there's, there's, there's a little bit of energy to that, and, I, and I'm mm -hmm. not being mean about it or something like that. And what, what are you doing to change that? Like, what do you do? You find yourself having to sort of like catch yourself in the moment and say, "No, wait, I'm going to stay." Or yes, I, I, I just Gaelic itself, trying to as, as much as I can do to kind of keep it. And using it is is more important than somebody's potential discomfort because that's not even really a thing. It's not even you know I haven't established that this person is uncomfortable. And if they are, geez, I can go to Toronto or New York City and go to any corner there and find any neighborhood where for these languages I don't speak, and I am not expected to. I'm not going to go up and say you know hey guys, speak English or mm -hmm. that would be really rude. You know, so yeah. I kind of try to foster that feeling. This is just a, as just as you were saying that I was thinking, and I wonder. This is for both of you. Have you ever had anybody say, "Could you please stop, you know, speak English or stop speaking Gaelic? I don't understand. I'm uncomfortable." Has that ever even been said out loud that you heard? I, I can't think of any any experience that I, that I've had of that. But generally, if if I'm speaking Gaelic in a particular environment, it's it's a Gaelic it's a Gaelic environment or a Gaelic event or something like that, which will have people who are from all walks of life who are learners at different levels, but also some people who don't. But within that sort of organised event, more often than not, you would have some sort of translation facilities available anyway, uh, which really is one way forward of just trying to be as inclusive as possible for, for everybody. Um, I, ca I can't think of, of anywhere really. Mm -hmm. It's interesting though, isn't it? That, that we, that's our, our feeling. And I even felt it when I, you know, I was making lots of mistakes because I was nervous and when I was asking you those, even those simple questions. But, you know, it's as we were talking and as you were answering the questions, I just felt, more and more and more uneasy about what about the people who don't understand are they going to leave is they get you know and it's sort of like who cares but that's that's so deeply ingrained in us you know 
Yeah. I wonder where that comes from. Do you have any, do you think it really is as simple? It's not simple, but it's about that kind of politeness. What do you think, Robert? Yeah, but there's probably that, but there's been a lot of, you know, there's, there's our ancestors and my parents and their generation before that have been taught to kind of feel bad about Gaelic too. Yeah. So that like, there's not a lot of courage with it because, you know, my, my grandmother, when she would say, how do you do? She put on a long face because that was probably the first English sentence she learned in school, you know? Mm -hmm. No, no, we don't say Kim and a how, we say, how do you do? Like this, and she would kind of make this face because, and, and there's there has been some internalized shame around that. And, uh, you know, and I, I would hope, I want to change that. I, I think, you know, we all kind of want to change that because it's, it's not warranted. It's a lovely language and it's a lovely expression. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be a, a two-way thing, though, because coming from the education system that I, that I worked in, you know, 80%, when I first started 35 years ago within Gaelic medium education, 80% of the families would have had Gaelic, sending very small numbers, to be fair, but uh, small numbers in class, etc. By the time I left, 80% of the families had no Gaelic. And what some of them were second generation Gales, possibly others just wanted to learn Gaelic. You know, the profile had been raised in lots of different ways. But equally though, you as, as an educator wanted to encourage as many of them to get involved within the system and to try and learn some of the language themselves. And from the get go, we, when we met with parents who were interested in sending their children, we made it quite clear that we expected them to learn Gaelic alongside their children because Gaelic just couldn't be seen as a school activity, that it also had to be seen outside of the school. So it was valued by everybody who was involved in the community. And a, you had parents who were stalwarts and you know went to the classes and got involved in the school, but you also had parents who didn't and never learned any Gaelic as their children progressed through, through the school. But I, again, I would still say that, you know, we want to be as inclusive as possible and encouraging as possible to just kind of do our best that the parents were, were involved in the system and their children came to the school. Do you think that, you know, thinking about some of those conversations with parents, do you think, um, people just went into those meetings with you already having made up their mind? Do you, did you ever like win hearts? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, did, did you see strategies that were more successful at maybe having somebody who was on the fence or less convinced to actually yeah. say, oh no, you're right, I'm gonna do this? I'll tell you quite honestly, we never had to advertise the school widely because the reputation of the school was it was highly regarded Gaelic medium education the the kind of curriculum that was offered the opportunities that were offered the confidence of the young people the ethos of the school was known far and wide so parents came desperately trying to get their children into the school but we did the same thing as you did Ian we spoke to them in Gaelic as they sat before us and we spoke and had children speaking in Gaelic to them before we went into English, just to make sure that they had an understanding of what we were trying to do, just setting out our stall. And, you know, we scared the bejesus out of them, I have to say, <laughs> some of them, we did, we yes. did. But, but generally though, the school offered a lot of support and the community and the education department offered a lot of support for parents and that, that helped. Uh, but you're still you still have some people who just have a particular reason for wanting their child in the school that might not be anything to do with Gaelic. Well, and it's interesting as you were saying that I don't want to reveal too many details, but like I have a friend in Scotland who's a Gaelic speaker and has a, a, a relation who isn't. And this this relative put their kids in Gaelic medium education and was really excited about this, which I think that's a, a good thing to be excited about. But they asked my friend if, if my friend had any advice for them. And my friend said, well, you should learn Gaelic too. And they said that the response from the relative was, just, you know, just all happiness yeah. drained out of their face kind of thing. Yeah. And it's, 
you know, like, I think this is an, I don't know if this is Robert's experience or not, but a lot of sort of middle-class people in Canada who live in English speaking areas, put their kids in French immersion, but they don't speak French themselves. They just expect their, their kids are going to emerge fully bilingual. And mm -hmm. even though the mm -hmm. only place French exists is, is in that classroom from, mm -hmm. you know, sort of eight to three. Um, so I, I guess, um, you know, it's interesting to think about how, how you kind of reach those people. Um, and I, I want to come back to that in a minute and kind of talk about some of those strategies. But I also, I want to bring Robert in again and sort of ask, you know, what have you noticed about places where, and this could be your own personal life or people you know, um, which I guess is also your personal life. Uh, but what have you noticed about where um, people stay in Gaelic for a long period of time? Like, what do those situations have in common with each other? Um, it seems now that there's there's a there's a kind of a core group in Nova Scotia, at least. There's a neighborhood, and it's 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 in places, and it's online, and it, but there's a community of Gaelic speakers. I left Nova Scotia in 2005, and I was gone for you know basically 10, 15 years, or whatever it was, and it wasn't like that. I felt like I was the youngest Gaelic speaker in Nova Scotia kind of thing, and I was talking to my cat, and that's that's how it felt. And that might not have been accurate, but now there's just there's there's a lot of young people. There's people moving to Nova Scotia specifically to learn Gaelic, and that is phenomenal. You know, I don't think my great grandmother would understand that, but she would be overjoyed. And 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 uh, you know, legislators and everybody should be looking at this because Nova Scotia is uniquely positioned to 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 kind of harness some of that North American yearning for that, what it is lost. And you don't have to go over this overseas to do it. You know, a lot of a lot of people can do it. You can drive up to Nova Scotia in the summertime and hear a bit of Gaelic. And and that is that is amazing that that is and that it's growing now. I don't know if that I answered the question. I just went on a rant there, Ian. I'm sorry. Well, it's it could be you could be two things at the same time, and that's fine. Do you so the I assume you still talk to your cat, but what are some of the other contexts you're using the language in now? I use it as much as I can. I drop sentences at the store, I say little greetings to people who might not even be gay. And I do it with affection and with joy. And they're like, well, what's this silly guy on about? And and when I meet people that speak Gaelic, I try to foster that, that it's really interesting. It's very different. It's a different mode. And if you can get in it, it will do you a world of good. Look how much fun we're having over here. Come on, take a look. <laughs> that kind of idea. I want to ask, I want to get to Nalda in again and just sort of ask for the sorts of things that Robert's describing, those kinds of situations where you're going to use the language. How do you how do you create those? Is it as simple as just starting to speak in Gaelic? I think uh, from my, from my own experience uh, in Glasgow, you know, the authority uh, and the government have a have a lot to do with the raising of the profile of Gaelic. And I suppose the Gaelic language plans that have been introduced across Scotland have to some degree helped in, in various places, but I can speak from the context I'm in here in Glasgow. Certainly Glasgow City Council have supported Gaelic medium education to the level that it's at now, having um, it up to secondary level and the creation of three primary schools in the city with a, a Gaelic unit created last summer and another school in the offing for 2023. There are issues surrounded about that with regard to staffing and that sort of thing, but we've always had that. All my whole career was spent trying to find Gaelic teachers. But equally, I went on the train into the city centre the other day and I go along through an area that is, you know, is, is well known within the city, Mary Hill and the train station names are in Gaelic. So there are, there are pockets of Gaelic just featuring right through, throughout the city. And I think that's important for even just, you know, people seeing the language and trying to find out about the language. Not everybody will, as we all know who are Gaelic speakers, there's always a resistance to it and the usual things thrown out about what a waste of money, et cetera. But we persevere. And I, I think in the city here, and, and it's reflected maybe throughout Scotland, you know, that 
garlic is becoming more predominant, but we could be doing a, a lot more. And I think it's important what, what Robert said there about using garlic in all the circumstances that you can. And if somebody, you know, your accent gives you away sometimes, where are you from? And, you know, you're able to tell people about uh, the kind of background that you've got. And I, th I think it's important from the point of view that you should be proud of sharing that with, with other people. Uh, and regardless of what sort of response you're going to get, it's it's um, it's all you know it's positive for the language in in, in whatever shape or form. Do you, I I want to ask you, Robert, about you know we've talked a little bit about sort of um, you know space for the language and at kind of a, a, a sort of a group level, if you will. But in terms of a, as you know, and a learner yourself in terms of being an individual learner who's trying to stay in the language. I mean, this is certainly something I've noticed a lot that people will get to a certain point and they'll they'll sort of come to the edge, maybe not the end, but the edge of their knowledge of the language. And then they switch to English, maybe to get around a particular subject, but then it never goes back. Do you have any thoughts about what you need to be thinking and doing to just sort of keep going in Gaelic? Yeah, there's, that's a good that's a good point. It takes a little bit of effort at, as, as a learner. You're going to have to put it on. You're going to have to don the Gaelic mantle. And it feels a little unnatural at times. You're like doing this as a learner in Nova Scotia. You've got to don this thing. you got to put it on. It was taken away from us. It was unnaturally removed. So that, there, that effort that is maintained that you have to kind of use to keep going with Gaelic. Then you lapse into English and you say computational science because you don't know how to say that in Gaelic. And then you go back to the Gaelic. That's trying to stay that course is, uh, I, I feel a sense of obligation to do that if, if I can, because, mm -hmm. because it was not fair what happened to Gaelic as a language, as it was treated, just, just off the hop, just like that, just as a linguistic, expression on planet earth it was poorly treated by well you know i think i think you're being very kind <laughs> i can't whenever people talk about that too i can't help but think about really you're going to complain about a sign when yes. you know what was done to children for literally generations mm -hmm. but anyway that's that's yeah. <laughs> we could talk about that another time uh although it's all connected of course um do you can you think of an example robert in your own life when you've when you've done that, when you've really come up against a wall and you've just kept going? Oh, well, I mean, the walls often have been just the limits of my own Gaelic, you know, yeah. not so much maybe somebody giving me a hard time for speaking it, but work with what you have, you know, you, you can, uh, if you gotta dip, use an English word or whatever, I mean, just trying, trying to stick in that Gaelic idiom or whatever and, and going with that. It's, it's good for you. It's good for me. I found it is just mm -hmm. a healing exercise. It is a mental uh, discipline that has untold benefits for me personally. I, I can't tell my accountant that, but I know this to be very mm -hmm. true, you know, <laughs> and it, they're, they're evident in my own life so, so clearly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to ask you now, Dinalda, a question about um, people who aren't speakers and the ways that they can help learners or people who who are fluent speakers um with their language what what kind of ways can sort of what you might call allies be support to learners and, and fluent speakers i think again going going back to the to the experience that i had um in in glasgow when the the primary school first opened nothing nothing happened with regard to gallic medium education in glasgow their parents the parents who pushed and pushed and pushed and got support from various bodies, the local authority, government officials, etc., to get the funding to, to get Gaelic medium education started. And, it, and so it continued in all my time as, as head teacher without parents working with you and alongside you and working with other parents to help bring them into the community. Um, you, you're on a, on a hiding to nothing. And what had been established <coughs> when the primary school opened, that the, the demand for Gaelic classes increased tenfold within that first year. Uh, and again, it might have been the, the perception that 
you needed to have garlic to come into the school, although that was a perception that was out there somewhere, but it wasn't certainly our um, philosophy, if you like. But the parents also run a Saturday morning club uh, that was for parents to come, whatever stage they were at in their language learning, uh, and to bring their children. And the children were catered for in either a creche or a youth club. And that was usually run by young people from the secondary school who'd been through Gaelic meeting, these excellent role models. And you need to have young people uh, who, who take on that role to, to continue the kind of growth for, for Gaelic medium into the future. Because if they don't take the experience that they've had within Gaelic medium and use it to further revitalize the language or preserve the language, whatever phrase you want to use, um, my, my career <laughs> has not worked out, but I don't think that's gonna happen, I think. Uh, and I meet young people who are sending their own children to Gaelic medium. And, and I, I know I'm, I'm very much promoting the Gaelic medium education and why shouldn't I because it's been a success for creating the next generation of, of Gaelic speakers and to bring other people uh, into learning the language and whatever the way that will be. So this Saturday morning group was um, oversubscribed so many people wanted to, to come to it so things like that are useful but also having people on the ground who will develop things within the arts and culture because that's important as I said as well it shouldn't just be seen as a school thing it's got to have other things that Gaelic is used for other contexts so it, but it's people you need and it's people who volunteer their time and there are many of them who do, who do that and do sterling work alongside um, the Gaelic plans and, the, and they, they're and, and maybe quietly in the background, but they all play their part. What I don't want to see is us groups of various people who want Gaelic to, to survive and to thrive falling out with each other. Uh, and I saw something, yeah, there's, there's a film at the moment on social media and I can't remember the, the phrase ex exactly, but it, somebody, I think Robert maybe touched on it earlier, you know, English words coming into your, your Gaelic. I just think you can build on that. You can, you can change that. You can learn how to say that, but it's the confidence because sometimes that's what's lacking with learners. They just, if they meet somebody who's a fluent speaker, they worry that they're going to pronounce it wrong or say something that's not quite, quite correct. So um, it was something along the lines of Gaelic I can't remember. Somebody who's maybe on this forum might, might uh, uh, remember what that was, but I thought it was quite a unique and appropriate phrase for what we're talking about tonight. I would, uh, I would love to continue this conversation. Uh, it's after midnight now for you, uh, for hours more, but we're running a bit short on time. So I just want to ask each of you um, a question to kind of wrap things up. Um, and hopefully go out on a positive note. And also you can, um, you can sing the praises of Gaelic medium education as much as you want. Nobody's gonna stop you here. Uh, I thought you, you said you can sing and I'm so, oh my goodness, it's too late. Well, you can do that too. Uh, uh, Robert, I'll ask you first, what would you say is the greatest asset to Gaelic usage in Nova Scotia? What is the, what is the thing we have going for us, do you think? It's, it's, a, it's an amazing way of looking at the world. Simply, if you're in the Gaelic and you're looking at things, it, you can res, there's, there's potential for resolution of problems that the English eye or whatever is just going to jump over. And uh, I've used it, I use it, for me, it's just been a, a personal boon. It's been something that's been really valuable. The more I've built on it in my life, the, more, the stronger it gets the greater my sense of self becomes and then my, my obligations to my community and my obligations to, to you know, the province or whatever have only strengthened. And I've just, I've fallen in love with Nova Scotia. I'm learning its history in a brand new way because it's amazing. It's beautiful. There's, there's, so, there's so much there. And uh, there's a sense of, there's, 
in Nova Scotia, we've had the sense that you know, we've, we've lost courage in a lot of ways. And we've seen it. Oh, yeah, you got to go out west. You got to go. There's nothing there for you. you know? And it drives me. It drives me right to the core. Because, because if we just said, no, absolutely, that is incorrect, there is stuff right here. And shout it from the rooftops, then they'll see. Because it's not the case. If it's, there's lots here. And Gaelic has kind of helped me to see that clearly. Thank you, Robert. And Donalda, what would you say is the greatest asset for Gaelic in Scotland? I think young people. I, I would say young people who have either been through Gaelic medium education or who have learned Gaelic as a result of just the kind of high profile people who are now involved in, in, in learning the language, because all of that helps. But I would say my belief is that the, the young people who ha have been through Gaelic medium will be the standard bearers as we, as, we, as we continue to keep this language going. And I would hope that within the, the education that they've received, that they have this instilled in them a pride of having the two windows on the world and the opportunities that uh, that they will encounter as a result of having learned this this other other language that they may not have had any experience of within their families because the socioeconomic mix of young people now who are involved in Gaelic is phenomenal uh, and the perception of it's oh it's just middle class families that's not 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 anymore and the benefits of being bilingual is in, in amongst that um so just simply young people are the greatest asset i would say thank you i some people might say this is naive but that doesn't mean it's untrue i, I would say that anything that's been done can be undone so hopefully having heard everything we just have there's a lot to reflect on and we can all sort of move forward and and do all we can to be fighters for our language. I want to thank you both. That was so generous of you to spend this time with us and share your wonderful insight uh, and thought. Uh, we're running a little uh, behind, which is that's my fault, uh, but we are going to be moving into breakout rooms now. Um, and I believe we have maybe, now I've got to hopefully, New Glasgow High School taught me well. I think we have 18 minutes. Um, so that's six <laughs> minutes each in a three-person breakout room. I cannot help you if you're in a two. Oh, two, I can. That's uh, nine. Four, no idea. So we're going to break into breakout rooms. Uh, and I'm going to ask that you answer a couple of questions. So divide the time equally. And these are the questions we're going to ask you to sort of think about. Uh, and we'll also put them in the chat. So uh, three questions. The first is, what resonates with you most from tonight's conversation? The second is, how might you think or act differently in your own Gallic language life after hearing this conversation? And finally, what is your biggest wish for Gallic? So we'll send you away to your breakout rooms now, come back and, and uh, sort of regroup. Uh, and again, huge thank you to Donald and Robert. Uh, I have a question for Robert. What was your grandmother's name, Ansevet? Um, great to meet new people who are like-minded in their interest. Um, and someone shared in my breakout room that polite isn't the word for it. It's colonized. It's helpful to call it what it is. Um, some people agreeing with Alma. Uh, very inspired. It was great chatting to another learner in Gaelic. We understood each other. I feel inspired to speak more. Keep learning. I think immersion is the way to go. Uh, so Robert's grandmother was Annie. Oh, I've lost, I've lost Annie's. Annie McDonald. Uh, I like Robert's approach. Uh, drop a Gallic sentence in the midst of whomever you are speaking with. Uh, I want to spend more time seeking out opportunities to practice my spoken Gallic. Language is so important as a carrier of culture and values. So we are coming um, to the end of our time, but I would encourage people to continue to post. Uh, we do put the uh, videos that we recorded online and we also uh, capture uh, some of the highlights of the chat. So I would encourage you to, to um, 
to follow us online um, and continue to read some of the comments. So uh, as we are now drawing to a close on the evening, um, I would uh, like to turn things over to Margie, who's going to talk to us about her session next week. Hello. Okay. Yes. Well, Shinuhainian and uh, and guess what a great night. Um, another great night, and um, and we've we're walking away with a lot more now from it. So, uh, well done all. Hopefully, you can join us again next week, same time, same place. Um, the plan is uh, is to chat about. Uh, the topic of community. Community is going to come up um, a good amount of times, I think, in the course of these sessions, but uh, we're going to focus in on it next week, uh, talk a little bit about um, what it's like to perhaps live in a Gale talk, uh, in, a, in a Gaelic rich uh, area, and perhaps one living in a, in a modern world that's uh, many cultures combined and um, and how to find your way, uh, perhaps online communities um, or in-person communities, what we get out of it and what we give to it. So um, my guests will be um, Casey Beaton, uh, a great gal from Mabu, Cape Breton, and uh, we'll hear her take and her beautiful prose on the topic. Um, and also Adam Dahmer, who uh, comes to us from Calgary, um, originally from Kentucky, and, uh, and and who I met through this uh, this community, and uh, we're going to talk to him about what he's doing um, at home and abroad online, and um, and what we can uh, do to foster strong communities in this in this Gaelic modern world. So hopefully you'll join us, um, and um, and we'll be back for more great lively chats very soon. Thank you so much, Margie. Really looking forward to that. Um, I just want to, uh, as we wind down, um, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to sing, uh, but if somebody else was going to, uh, maybe they could uh, wave and indicate that. Uh, we were talking about that before the session, so we'll see what happens there. Um, but as that's kind of possibly stewing, uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to Donalda McComb and uh, Robert Pringle for being such wonderful guests tonight, for sharing their uh, insight and their knowledge. Uh, it was very inspiring, as many people said in the chat. Uh, I want to thank everybody at the Gaelic Narrative Project, and uh, particularly Susan and Shannon and Kieran for doing so much on the tech side tonight. I also want to thank the Office of Gaelic Affairs in uh, Nova Scotia and How We Thrive, who are co-hosts of these sessions. Uh, and most of all, I want to thank all of you for continuing to come out and to share with us and to be open to this process. Uh, it really would be nothing without you. So, um, top of Ola. And with that, I will step aside and wish you all the best. And is somebody who's Yes, have, Robert going to say yes. Yeah, Amigdala, Amigdala Hain, who's a whole dunya for Naroi. Hello. Good. Ah, show my show my high talk. The new towel, the rain and gutter. The new towel, the rain and gutter. The new towel, the rain and gutter. The proud let you will be proud. Ilian be ko yoro, Ilian be ko yoro, Ilian be ko yoro, Ware no pila, Natural let you work in Brahe, Natural let you work in Brahe, Natural let you work in Brahe, the same old and gave in the cold, your own. In the cold, your own. In the cold, your own. For a long time. Spend all and kale alive. Spend all and kale alive. Spend all and kale alive. Beaching crown, now, your 
ilande ko lloro ilande ko lloro ilande ko lloro por el olvido amigin crown down der maca amigin crown down der maca amigin crown down der maca Quando io rano mi appare, mi lende con gli oro, mi lende con gli oro, mi lende con gli oro, cuore no. Mi rano in mio cale, mi rano in mio cale, non mi rano in mio cale. Shala can she in a green art town. Eden de Colioro. Eden de Colioro. Eden de Colioro. Who are no way. Shala can she in a green art town. Shala can she in a green art town. Shall I can she in a dream in our town? Sarom me obey the other. Eden de Colioro. Eden de Colioro. Eden de Colioro. Who are no favor? Sarom me obey the car. Sarom me obey the car. Sarong me obeyin ta la vi elan brak pana. Ilan be ko lloro. Ilan be ko lloro. Ilan be ko lloro. Who are no people. Di kirlan brak pana. Di kirlan brak pana. Di kila na brato pa na kuna ni to ng salo, ilende ko yoro, ilende ko yoro, ilende ko yoro, kuwa eno kila. That's beautiful, Robert. Thank you. Mine. Mad Amy Rappers, Ganel Desi Ain. Dinner cash. Nice discussion. Since you have. Happy late. Clave. Thank you, Valive. Thank you, Valive. Thank you, Valive. Thank you, Valive. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. Sorry, Lady, thank you, Valerie. Mash and leave, Hamish. <laughs> Mash and leave.